Here we go. Let's get the party started. We got some Canadians in the house. I was saying before, before we started this, that uh, I am the lone U.S. American in this journey we call life. But no, we're excited to have both Sadie and Mackenzie here to share more about their personal perspectives when it comes to testing negative. Um, you know, just wanted to welcome everyone for, for joining. And really the goal of this is to hear from HD community members, just sharing, you know, personally what that journey looked like and to share just how that felt. And we'll kind of go into each of their stories individually, and then we'll open it up for Q and A's, which you can use either for the using the uh, chat feature or clicking the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Or you could just mess, I think, I don't know if you can message me in, individually, but I would say, yeah, the chat or the Q&A is probably the best. And I'm sure I'll, I might have some uh, questions for you, the two of you afterwards. But without further ado, Mackenzie and Sadie are both two young people from Canada. And I'm excited just to hear more about each of their stories. And so we're going to start with Sadie. And Sadie, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. So as Seth said, I am from Canada. And more specifically, I'm from the province of Ontario. Uh, Matt will probably talk about another province in Ontario, or sorry, another province in Canada. But my story will be about Ontario. So here in Ontario, it's a lengthy process to get tested for Huntington's disease. Um, and this process can't get started until you are 16 years of age, but it could be earlier if you have juvenile Huntington's disease. But for myself, I had to go to the family doctor first before I could go through with the testing. So I had to get a referral from my family doctor, which took a couple of weeks. And then when that was processed, I went to the hospital and during this time they informed me what HD was, but I already knew that from my family history and from my own research, but I still listened to them. And then they were also talking about how the process was going to work. And then they sent me for my blood. Um, so during the time of getting my blood drawn and waiting for the results, it was a long six weeks. Um, I would examine every movement, every twitch, every slur of the words. And I would often break down at night thinking, okay, I have HD. I often thought I was alone in this. And I would not talk to anyone about HD, which looking back, I should have reached out to my support system and talked about what I was going through. A couple of years down the road, I did talk to my two sisters and they were saying that they went through the exact same thing where they didn't talk to anyone. They broke down at night and they often cried themselves to sleep. So looking back, we should have kind of been there for each other and like talked about it. So once the blood um, went and came back from Toronto, um, they gave my foster parents and I a call and told us that the results are in. And once I heard this news, I booked the next appointment and we were off to hear what the results were. Um, so just a little side note, um, I have been in foster care since I was six years old. Um, just for that reason is because of um, my mom's illness. My mom was not physically and mentally able to look after her five children, even with the help of the, um, the stepfather. The foster care system did try to keep us in the care of our mom, but the illness made it impossible to do so. Um, with this being said, we still saw our mom and still had a great relationship and made the times that we did see her a lot more memorable and special to us. So going back to our appointment here, my foster parents um, and I all sat in a room waiting to hear the results. I remember the nurse asking me specifically, are you sure you wanna hear the results to this? And I'm like, okay, like, does that make it positive? Like, I'm not really sure why she asked me that question, but it still haunts me to this day to be like, I don't know why she asked that, because it made me more nervous and more stressed um, to hear the results. Um, but I did go forward to wanting to know the results and um, even thinking back, 
I think in um, Ontario, there is supposed to be a social worker in the room and they're supposed to be present during your appointments, um, which I didn't have. I'm pretty sure they're supposed to be there for that last appointment when your results are being read. But that was not the case for me. So I had the nurse and the doctor pull the results out of the envelope and um, they told me I don't have Huntington's. And they talked about the CAG count, but I don't remember hearing anything else but the words, you do not have HD. So the three of us all cried and it was a happy little memory there. So after the appointment, I went to my uncle's, I told him the news, I went home to tell my siblings. Um, everyone was delighted to hear the news, but I often felt guilty telling my siblings about the news as some of them were not tested at this point. And I just didn't want to share my news when they were still stressed about what was going to happen with their results in their testing process. So that was basically the journey of my um, HD results and how I tested negative. But during this time, there was a lot of feelings and emotions. Um, as I mentioned before, I was scared and felt alone during this time. But I knew I, I had the strongest support system and I should have allowed myself to come and talk to them during this point and during the time of this testing. Also, the emotion of, emotion of happiness was there when I got told the news and I told others about my news, as I knew I would never develop HD in my life. But there was also the emotion of guilt lingering around. I often struggled with survivor's guilt and I would rather have like, sorry, for myself, I'd rather have HD than one of my siblings have it. Um, but in that case, it didn't happen. Um, I also often don't talk about HD around people who do have it as I don't wanna show my happiness of not having HD, but also it's a struggle with that point especially one of my brothers did test positive for it. So having those relationships or having those conversations are hard because I want to be happy for myself, but I also don't want to show happiness when I know what he's going through um, with testing positive. So the last thing I do want to touch upon is why I got tested in the first place. So I knew from first grade I wanted to be a teacher um, but if I had HD, I don't think this dream of mine would have worked. So here in Canada, it takes six years to become a teacher and then you have to supply and then you have to get a full-time position. So it's a pretty lengthy pro uh, process to become a full-time teacher. So in my family, HD starts at a younger age because of the CAG count. My mother recently passed away um, after a long fight with Huntington's. Um, but she started to show symptoms in her late 20s um, and the deep disease progressed um, until she was 49. So looking at this when I was a teenager, I knew if I had HD, I would not have the time to go to school for six years, supply and then get the full-time position and start my career before I started showing symptoms. This is the main reason I wanted to know if I had HD or not, It would because it would have determined what career I chose to be. So with not having HD, I was able to go to school to become a teacher. I'm just finishing up my last year of school right now. Um, and then hopefully by April, I'll have my degree and on the journey of becoming a full-time teacher. So I'm not sure what I would have done <laughs> if I had HD um, and knowing the results were not negative. Um, I'm not sure if I would follow my dreams to become a teacher or what I would have done, um, but here I am with the results being negative and on my journey to become a teacher. So that's about it for me. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, in the Q&A section. I would be happy to answer anything. Um, if you just wanna message me privately, I totally understand that as well. Um, but for now, I am done with my little spiel. So I'm gonna hand it over to Mac and we'll hear a little bit about his um, journey. All right, uh, thank you, Sadie. Um, so I'll start with a little bit about my experience with Huntington's and then kind of how that led into uh, my decision to get genetic testing. Um, so growing up, um, basically since the day I can remember, I witnessed my aunt with uh, late stages of uh, Huntington's. So um, I experienced the worst side of Huntington's with a, a loved one before the beginning compared to most people. Um, so around seven or eight, my aunt had passed away. 
Um, and then at about 11 or 12, um, my parents sat my sister and myself down and they told us that my mom was gene positive. Um, so from that moment there, um, I was definitely worried about Huntington's. And since I knew about it, I knew that at that point I had a chance of having it. Uh, but a year or two later, so around 13 years old, is uh, when I started to get more involved in the HD community. Um, I attended my first conference, uh, which was uh, in Winnipeg uh, that year, so about an hour away from my hometown. So we decided, hey, let's go. And they're having a uh, young people affected by Huntington's disease day. Um, so I went to that as well. And that's kind of where I first learned about genetic testing and what it was. And that at that moment, that's kind of when I decided it's uh, what I wanted to do because as the person I am, I wanted to know everything and anything um, that I could, as much information as I can have so I can make the best decision possible. Um, so at 13, I knew I was gonna get tested. So that left five years um, before I turned 18 and that's when I could start my process. So um, over those five years, as I started to get older each year, I started to think about testing more and more um, in my everyday life. And so um, I turned 18 in February of my uh, last semester of high school. And basically from that point on, all I was thinking about at school was Huntington's. Like in class, I was always distracted because I had this big lifelong decision um, that I was coming up to near the end of uh, high school. Um, so, at that point, a teacher noticed that I hadn't been the same in class and he wanted to check in and make sure I was okay. And I kind of told him uh, what was going on. And um, I was lucky enough that um, based on the relationship I had with my teacher, he set up um, for the school division social worker to come in and just make sure I was okay and support me through this and like kind of make sure I'm not worrying about school while I'm worrying about this big decision in my life. Um, so I, I just made sure that I had a lot of support both at home and from the school while going through this and um, I was very lucky for that. So um, when I turned 18 in February, a week later, I made my appointment with um, my general practitioner, my doctor, and I asked for a referral for genetic testing. So about a month or two later, um, I met with the genetic counselor and uh, we kind of just went over and made sure that I, I knew what Huntington's was. And of course I did because I'd ex experienced it all my life with uh, people I love and just making sure I know what this process looked like and uh, making sure I had the proper resources and support in place for um, testing. And so after that, I got my blood drawn. And then um, literally a week after I graduated from high school, I found out um, that my results were in and I could go in to find them out. So um, I brought my uh, I brought my uh, my dad and my my girlfriend um, along with me to find out my results. And on the way there, like I was literally a block or two away from from finding out my results. And I literally had to stop and go find the nearest washroom to like just throw up and literally just get sick because I was so nervous and anxious about this because it's something I'd been thinking about for like the past five years. Um, so. I sat down, I was super anxious. All I remember is just my sweaty hands and just sitting there like, okay, this is literally all I've been thinking of. I've been so worried. I'm, I'm even more afraid to find out that if I'm, if I'm gene negative, I was more worried about being gene negative than positive. Like Sadie was saying, because I had a sibling, I would rather have Huntington's than have my sibling have it. Um, so then all of a sudden the genetic counselor just says, you've tested negative and I, I didn't believe her at first because growing up I just believed that it was always something I had like if I had a little twitch oh it's Huntington's disease oh I forget something this is Huntington's disease so um, it kind of just took me a moment and I had to actually physically look at the paper with the results and sit there for it to kind of hit me and and realize like wow I actually don't have this disease um, so I was in shock and very happy. So like, as soon as I got out of there, I started calling everyone that I knew and letting them know the good results. But um, it didn't necessarily hit me that I was negative for the next little bit. And um, once it kind of finally started hitting me, I started to feel a little more guilty and out of place in the HD community. Um, a little bit of survivor's guilt because I already had so many people that I known in the HD community for the past like five years that were positive. And then now I'm finding out I'm negative. Um, 
it's kind of left a sour taste in my mouth almost because all these people that I love so much and I've barely met, but I know them so well because of this disease in 10, 15 years, they're going to start dealing with this like our parents have. And then I'm lucky enough that I'll be negative and I just watch this happen to them. So survivor's guilt has definitely been a big part of dealing with my results. And even though like I'm 21 now, it's been almost three years that I've tested, I'm still dealing with my results and still dealing with a little bit of survivor's guilt. Um, even where like people that I know that might not even be related to anything to hunting pins and something bad happens to them, I feel a little bit of guilt because out of the one bad thing in my life, I had a little bit of positive experience where I tested negative and then so I start to feel a little guilty. So I'd say survivor's guilt is definitely very real. Um, but yeah, like throughout the process where I was, um, I had, I made sure I had amazing support throughout. I reached out to the community, uh, people I knew uh, to figure out their experience uh, about testing. So I knew everything, all these little things, because I've heard bad experience, good experience. So I wanted to be very prepared. I also used the resources on HDYO's website, which is very, very full of great resources. Um, and also contacted the Huntington Society of Canada um, and got their support as well. So um, yeah, I just making sure I had great support was definitely very um, important and left a positive experience. Um, but yeah, like to this day, I'm still dealing with my negative result and dealing with survivor's guilt. And that's everything I had. Well, thank, thank you both for, for sharing, you know, Sadie McKenzie, I think just hearing hearing that is so important because I think what's challenging and I hear it a lot too is you know kind of the whole concept of testing negative and feeling that survivor's guilt and you know out of, out of curiosity did either of you feel kind of maybe more pressured to get tested because of having siblings did that play a role at all of saying wow maybe I need to get tested for, for my sibling's sake versus my own or is there anything that went on there? Um, so I come a family of five, so there was five of us who all had to get tested. I shouldn't say all of us had to get tested. Um, four of the five of us are tested right now. Um, I was the second one to get tested. Um, I didn't feel pressure from the siblings. I just felt my two older brothers didn't get tested um, prior to me. So I just felt why if they're not getting tested, should I not get tested? Um, so the three sisters got tested first and we all came back negative. Um, I think I think the, the brothers struggle with that a lot because if you look at the odds, it doesn't look too well for them. As you can see, three out of five are negative. Okay, what are the odds that we all come back negative? Um, but what are the odds that they would be positive or one would be positive, one would be negative? Um, so often I wouldn't confide in my brothers and my sisters when I was getting tested because I didn't want um, to put added pressure on their decisions on what they were going to do. Um, I kept that to myself because I didn't want to burden them with my news or like my struggles when I was going through that, if that answers your question at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. And then that being yeah. said, Oh, I wouldn't even that? say that like I felt a pressure either like um, I think just like growing up me and my sister both made it like clear that we both had the idea of wanting to get tested um, there wasn't like any pressure but I think um, I was the first one out of uh, myself and like out of everyone that could be uh, affected by this uh, be gene like at risk or whatever um, there was five of us including uh, my three cousins and so I was the first one to test so I, I don't think there was any pressure for me personally um, being the first one out of the, the group of us to test um, and the way it came out negative I, I really hope it didn't add any pressure for the others to test but um, yeah I wouldn't say there was any pressure and, and you know it's interesting I think Sadie you mentioned this at one point and I'm not gonna uh, quote you exactly but something around the lines of like how you didn't necessarily want to share the news of like the this you know the happiness of, of testing negatives in some sense with other others in the HE community. And, it, you know, I, the, the reason I bring it up is because I think it's an interesting piece. Cause like for me, so I'm, my older sister's still at risk. I tested positive, but like 
um you know i i of course always want everyone to like test negative ideally i think what's what's challenging is you know what i've appreciated is you know people who test negative and then stay involved with the community right because you're like, all right, I'm good. Like, I don't need to worry about this anymore. But then it's like, well, what about all those other people you met along your journey or your mm-hmm. siblings or other family members? And so maybe you say to you and Mackenzie could maybe touch about what makes you guys stay involved and continue to advocate for HD. Um, do you want me to go first, uh, Mac? Okay. Um, so the reason that we collectively as me and my siblings stay in the HD community um, was a the reason for our mom like we wanted to help her the best way that we could and like going to conferences and like hearing um, different doctors or different like speakers speak about how and like what benefits that we could do to help her along in her like end stages Um, and then with her passing um, our older brother he is gene positive so the disease does not stop in our family. So it's gonna keep going. Um, so we just wanna, even if I'm negative, doesn't mean, okay, yeah, I don't have it. See you guys all later. There's a huge impact from all the people that I've met along this journey, not only just my siblings and like the London chapter, but like it goes beyond that. Like I know people all across the world who are affected by the HD. So just keeping in touch with everyone and keeping, um, me, myself involved is really helpful like even looking back after our mom passed last year um we created a bottle drive just to be able to raise awareness for Hankins and like raise money for it so we ended up raising about sixteen thousand dollars um through it all and we're trying again this year so just to keep ourselves motivated and being like this is our like kind of portion to help like advance the research and advance anything that we can do and to get, get support from any ones that it doesn't stop like even if you're negative or you're positive like highly suggest being involved with anyone that you can that's related to like the hd and just to add before matt goes is involvement in being involved oh there goes an update on my computer being involved you know it's going to look different for each person right so it's not saying you have to go all in and do everything right it's trying to figure out what what suits you and maybe it's blogging maybe it's fundraising maybe it's sharing your story on a panel like this right and I think that's what's important is you don't need to you know go all in or throw a huge like million dollar fundraiser Uh, you know I think even to me raising anything more than zero is always a success and then also sharing your story with one one person new person is always a success so Mm -hmm. Um, any little bit counts really like whether it's a small fundraiser or like you're looking at like a worldwide fundraiser like any way that you can like potentially share your story more people will understand and like learn about it so yeah I think um as someone who's negative and like I've been in the HD community basically my whole life um I've known so many people and met so many people through like conferences YPAD days um HDYO camps and stuff that um when I got my negative result it was like okay I understand I'm negative but all these people I care about they're either at risk or they're positive and this like I've experienced growing up like this and there's more out there every day that are going to experience this so whatever I can do to help make that process better and that experience better um, for the future I think is very big and as someone who's negative if we look 10 20 30 years from now the people that I know in the community that are positive they won't have the chance to um, fight and advocate for themselves like they can right now and me being negative and being there all this time I know them I'm building all these connections. There's got to be someone there to fight for them. And why not be me as someone who's already been affected? I've been in this community this long. Just because I'm gene negative, it doesn't mean I'm no longer a part of the community. It's just a different role. I'm no longer at risk. I'm negative. Um, And I can do so much as someone who's negative um, to help this community. So just continuing to do that and support the community that kind of almost helped raise me and make me who I am today. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks for that that perspective from both of you. 
uh, we do have a question. I think it's just more towards Sadie is, do you feel, you know, I think it's like that your relationship has changed with your gene positive siblings at all now that you tested negative? Um, I, I would say it's grown stronger, to be honest. I, I worry about him. And um, as a little sister, I don't know if I should worry about him in a normal, let's say, setting. Um, but I do worry about him. And I, I kind of watch over him, which I shouldn't. And like, I kind of look, okay, is he showing symptoms? Like, should I be co contacting his doctor soon about like, um, different things? Like, should he have a medical? Should he lose his license soon? He doesn't know any of this. So um, <laughs> if he hears it, it's whatever. Um, but I think the relationship has grown stronger between like my older brother and I, um, even the one with who hasn't got tested, he has two little kids. And I often stress about their lives as well. Um, a huge thing about me is I stress a lot, um, whether I should or not, but even like looking at them, I'm like, okay, like, does he have it? I'm not sure. Well, now these kids could be at a 50% 50, 50 chance if he does have it, what will happen to these kids? Like, as, as a foster child, I know how, like, you know, we can be taken away from our parents who really love and care about us. Um, so while well, this happened to like his kid and like, just everything goes through my mind. So, um, but to answer that question, I think it has grown stronger. Like by the end of the day, we didn't talk that much before he got tested um, due to certain situations. Um, but as soon as he did tell us that he was negative, um, the family did come together and we were able to support him through everything that he needed. Um, and we will continue to support him with whatever he needs as well um, as symptoms start showing and stuff. Yeah, and, and I think it's what's tough is, I think that's what HG does to us, makes us overthink everything in the future, right? And just like, what if this happens? What if that happens? Whether, you, again, whether it's yourself or a sibling, I think that's what's challenging sometimes with HD is the, the mental impact. And so, uh, you know, I'll kick it over to Mac and Sadie, feel free to chime in. But like, how did testing impact you mentally? I know you mentioned like, you're going full Eminem, you know, palm sweaty, the, I won't go into the song, but for the Eminem, <laughs> maybe, I'm, maybe I'm aging myself now, but you know, you meant like, what mentally was, was it like going through testing? Cause it's such a, you know, personal decision um it, it was tough um especially that like senior year of high school um because like it had been something for like four or five years that had been building up that I've been wanting to do so um kind of the fact like I, literally after I got my blood drawn like I couldn't tell you what happened at high school from like then on like in class at all like um, my mind was just always on Huntington's and the possibility and the future um, and like the plans I had for myself like before I got my results I had planned on going to university right away because if I tested positive I wanted to get a good career and started um, in the right direction um, and I had all these life plans based on my testing and so I was very anxious and like sad and worried going on throughout this whole process just because you, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, we don't know how we're going to react. We don't know anything that's going to happen. It's it's impossible to predict how we're going to react. Um, so I think mentally I wasn't in the best state, but um, because my teacher, he helped out quite a bit getting that support system uh, from the school division and stuff, but it helped quite a bit that I that all I really had, I was worrying about Huntington's and all I was focusing on, but it, they gave me the chance to really focus on that and deal with that. Um, so I wouldn't say I was doing very well mentally, but I think, um, I would definitely take that brief moment in my life where I wasn't doing me okay mentally to get the result that I did. Um, because like at the end of the day, we struggle with our mental health here in day out, whatever, but, um, I had enough support around me and I was in the proper position that I was able to like survive the mental health issues that I was having throughout this process. But um, I think just having the right support um, makes it more 
able to go through it, make you more able to, to persevere. Um, but like, because of my results, my mental health after as well was also affected. Like I just, I was almost lost because it wasn't the result that I thought I would have. Um, so like I ended up dropping out of university and not going because I just said like, I can do whatever I want with my life now because um, I, I don't have this like almost ticking time bomb of Huntington's in my body anymore. So um, yeah, like it, it definitely affected my mental health, even just getting the result because there was one part that I had been worrying about so much in my life that is now just like, poof, it's nothing to worry about anymore because I have this result on paper telling me that, oh yeah, that's not going to happen to you anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So like, I, I'd say after the results, even I felt lost and confused about like, what am I supposed to do with my life now? Like I had this plan. So um, like everyone kind of always associates getting that negative result as a good news only. But there are negatives and positives to getting that negative result. Um, there are good things like, yes, I won't have Huntington's, but now like my whole life was planned around Huntington's. What do I do now? So um, yeah, it's definitely like mental health uh, was definitely really affected and you got to make sure you're in a good place mentally before you start the process. Cause if you're in a bad place mentally, it's just, it's only going to get worse. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And unfortunately I'm sure this is, we could probably talk about this part of it as well. Um, but we are out of time. Um, so what I will say to kind of wrap things up is first and foremost, thank you, Sadie and Mackenzie for hopping on and sharing your personal stories and your perspectives. I, I know it's, you know, so important just to hear it from people that are going through it, right? It, it makes it more relatable. I will say for those that may be listening in who haven't tested yet, uh, make sure to, you know, reach out to your, you know, healthcare provider, a genetic counselor. Uh, again, these are just personal thoughts, uh, nothing along the lines of, you know, medical advice or check out, you know, HDO's uh, website with more additional resources. So, you know, and also, as Haley put in the chat, if you want to speak to someone, check out the HDO booth. So, Sadie and Mackenzie, thank you again. Um, you're off, I'll say you're off the hook. So you can, uh, you know, turn the camera off, you can still listen in and I'm excited to uh, already bring back on Tess and Tess and Aaron. So, all right. Well, thank you, Tess and Aaron, for joining us, and we'll just jump right into it. Oh, yeah. sorry. What What did you say, Tess? Glad to have, to be here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So this is now. You know, we talked. We just heard from Sadie and Mackenzie about testing negative. Now this is Aaron and Tess talking about testing positive. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of just quickly share. Tess is from Sweden. Aaron's from Canada, and they're gonna share about their personal testing experience, what it was like, and then we'll save some time at the end for some Q and A. So Tess, take it away. Thank you. So yes, I am from Sweden. And uh, I have known for about 15 years now that I am HD positive. And I have been looking for and obtaining information about the disease from the beginning, uh, which was then to say the least kind of vague. Uh, so who I was and who I am, that is what defines me today, I think. Uh, it all started when I was in my 30s because I was told that my future could be determined with a genetic test because my dad had been given something called Huntington's disease. And for that, I immediately became a person who had 50-50 risk of inheriting uh, a ne neurological disease. And um, that almost felt too big to take in. Uh, so while I felt a fear, I also felt a strong need to know. Um, and to know or get an answer to something that I already knew. Uh, or was it just an answer in itself that I needed? Anyway, uh, we had contact with the genetic clinic 
where we were and receive the news about my dad. And they told us about the process uh, that uh, would lead to have to take a blood sample uh, to get the answer. And uh, we were talking a lot with them about pros and cons. And they told us um, that it would take time, uh, that a psychologist visit would be booked, uh, etc. Uh, but the real thing was that they didn't have the capacity or resources to put in place for us. Uh, but um, I uh, and one of my brothers immediately said that we wanted to know now, preferably yesterday. Uh, and uh, of course, this is all about what kind of person you are. Uh, and in my head, uh, it was just that uh, the test would be done. And uh, whatever the answer was, it was uh, only then that I would take a position on how my life uh, should go on. Uh, I did not feel at all to sit and talk about something that I might not have inherit, uh, because maybe I was just a relative at this point. And uh, despite that, uh, we had to bother them a little bit more. And finally, about uh, one year later, uh, the day came where I would go get my test, get to know my hair rate. Uh, and the day the blood sample was taken, I didn't feel anything special. Uh, clearly nervous and thought that this is probably the most important blood sample I will ever take. Uh, but it was done. And now I just would have to wait for a couple of weeks. So uh, finally, the day came where I had um, time to return to this genetic clinic. And uh, it was in uh, January 2007. And I went there with my mom. And um, the only thing I, I actually remember is when we went into this tiny little room and with two people from genetic. Uh, and I think everything after that is kind of blur. Uh, then I talked, they talked, and I couldn't even remember anything. And uh, one of them had a paper on the table uh, that I immediately put my focus on. And uh, I saw it was re written like 43 sloppily written upside down. And I thought like four, three, okay, so that's it, just like that. And uh, I can hear the doctor saying that um, you tested positive for Huntington's with a CRG of 43 repeats. Um, so yeah, of course I fell. I feel my tears rolling down my cheek. I hear my mom's silent crying and um, sorry. And I see these two doctors just looking at me for some kind of response. I'm so sorry. It's been a long time ago since I'm telling this story. No worries at all, Tess. I mean, take your time and I think it's, you know. Yeah, it's it was really quiet. It's, it's, it's so much to take in, but yeah. But uh, yeah, rather quickly, I felt like I need to get out of here. I, I need to go and get to sort my feelings out. Um, and um, uh, sorry, uh, they had uh, no one to do follow ups on, uh, on people that uh, were giving this kind of results. Uh, so uh, e even if it was positive or neg negative, uh, but I knew that in advance, so it wasn't a shock, uh, but uh, still I actually uh, got a name of an older psychologist who, who was in my vicinity 
and was interested uh, in HD. So if I needed, I could uh, contact him in the future, which I did. Uh, so yeah, to get a result like this started something <laughs> within me that uh, like more people need to know about the disease uh, because it's so awful. And we, we can't be the only family affected by this. And um, information about HD was zero in Sweden. And if I found something online, it was uh, in English and uh, a scientific language, uh, which made no sense to me. So uh, approximately one year after my test, and even my brother who tested HD positive only weeks after me, uh, we then decided to do our own website, um, and a uh, rather personal one. Uh, so uh, when it was launched, we also had our family story in a weekly magazine. Uh, that all the same night that uh, came out, we had tons of people uh, coming to our website and lots of, lots of messages and emails. Uh, we couldn't never have imagined that. So from believing that we were totally, completely alone, uh, we realized that was not the case. Uh, and that is a great feeling. And um, as a result, we also got in touch with a researcher in Lund, uh, who we worked with a lot uh, to inform uh, via newspaper, television, radios, uh, conferences, and um, yeah, even uh, got in contact with people in the same situation in, in the rest of the world. Uh, so it is good uh, with um, great support, extremely important. And um, over the years I've been involved with HD, HD Association, both in Sweden and over the world. And I think the, the HD community is fantastic and more and more experienced each day. So we are stronger together and I think that is why we are sitting here today. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Tess, for, for sharing, you. sharing your story and just your courage yeah. and looking at the chat. You know, you got a lot of people sending positive thoughts, po positive vibes your way. So kudos to you for, for staying involved. And Aaron would love to hear kind of a little bit more about your story now. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here to talk about testing positive for HD. Um, so in my family, I didn't know about the existence of HD until I was around 31 years old. And it was when my husband and I decided to have a family and we went over to my parents' house for brunch one morning and we excitedly shared the news. Hey, mom and dad, guess what? You're probably gonna be grandparents next year. We're starting to have a family. And unfortunately, our news wasn't met with the excitement that we had anticipated. And we walked away from that brunch feeling kind of shocked. And it wasn't until a few days later that my parents told us the long held family secret that they suspected my grandmother had Huntington's disease when she passed away, but that was before the gene was discovered. So there was no way to know for sure. So since my biological clock was ticking, I decided to go through genetic testing and I found out that I tested gene positive for Huntington's disease a short eight months later, which as you can imagine is really not a lot of time to absorb the enormity of the decision that I was making and the impact that it could have on my life. After getting my test results, I fell into a very deep depression. I would sleep for 10 to 12 hours every night, but I still struggled to get out of bed every morning. I remember very vividly sitting on the edge of my bed and staring at a sock that had been on the floor for the past three days that I just didn't have the energy to throw into the laundry hamper. And somehow each morning I would manage to drag myself to work. Uh, but once I was there, I was barely able to function. I became terrified of answering the phone because I worked in retail. And as you can imagine, customers aren't always the nicest. And I knew if anybody was even slightly mean to me on the phone that I would just break down crying. 
And I was terrified of being anywhere by myself alone. And I constantly had to occupy myself by doing things or being out or being with with friends because anytime I was alone, I would start ruminating and I, I, I would start thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to get HD, I'm going to get HD. And then I, it would just develop into a full blown panic attack. But I didn't know that that's what they were at the time. But during all of this, I remember saying to myself, I don't want this to ruin my life. I want to be able to find happiness again. And considering how depressed I was, that was a pretty bold statement to make because I really didn't understand how it would be possible to ever be accepting of my diagnosis and to ever be okay with the fact that I was going to get HD. But I knew that that was my goal. So that's what I set out to do. So I started asking myself questions like, what do I really want out of life? Or what do I really feel is going to make me happy? And the answer I came up with was to have the family that I had always dreamed of having. But that left my husband and I with a very difficult decision to make. How were we going to have children now that our kids were at risk for inheriting HD as well? And what I told myself at the time was that my life had value as a person with HD and so would the life of my child if they happened to inherit HD from me. And we decided to conceive naturally. Um, this was far from a confident decision. <laughs> we really just had to move forward somehow, and that is the decision that we made. But in the back of my head, I was still wondering if I was doing the right thing. I didn't know if it was even morally correct to have children when I knew they were at risk. And anytime I imagined the moments after giving birth to my baby and then putting the baby in my arms, I always just imagined that moment being overshadowed with the thought, oh my God, does my baby have HD too? So there was a lot of guilt going on in the background and doubt. Unfortunately, after a year of trying, we still weren't pregnant and we ended up seeking the help of a fertility doctor. And we tried treatments that were as minimally invasive as possible at first, but unfortunately nothing worked. And after about a year or a year and a half of trying, the fertility doctor suggested in vitro fertilization as our next best option. And I knew that if I was going to do an IVF, I personally couldn't justify doing it without taking that one last step and doing genetic testing on the embryos. So we actually went through two rounds of IVF. I was a very poor responder to the drugs both times, so we didn't get a lot of embryos. And on our first round of IVF with PGD, Unfortunately, all of our embryos had Huntington's disease, so we didn't end up using any of those. And that left us feeling very stunned and not really quite sure how to move on. But since I kind of felt like we didn't even get a chance, we decided to do the process a second time around. And on our second time around, we had two embryos that were HD free and we implanted both of those embryos into my womb, but unfortunately they didn't result in a pregnancy. And by that point in time, I was sick of going to the fertility clinic. I was emotionally exhausted. I was physically drained and we were financially drained because IVF with PGD does cost quite a bit of money, but I knew I didn't want to give up on my dream of having a family. So we actually took a long time to investigate other options like surrogacy or living child free. And after a year of thinking about it, we decided to try adopting. Um, in order to adopt, you have to become adopt ready. And we went through 27 hours of adoption specific parenting classes. We were interviewed by a social worker for 10 hours and we had to submit our financial records and a medical and even get our fingerprints done. Um, and then I'm happy to let you know that one sunny June morning, when my husband and I were out shopping for a hot tub because we were pissed off that we couldn't have a kid and an adoption didn't seem to be coming through, we um, pulled out of one retailer and were driving along the road when my cell phone started ringing. And my husband looked at my phone and thought, why is a telemarketer calling you on a Sunday? But for some reason, he picked up the phone anyways, and he, the next thing I know, he's saying, Aaron, Aaron, pull over the car. And I veered the car into the next driveway I could find, and we were parked in the loading zone behind Costco, of all places. <laughs> and on the other end of the line was an adoption lawyer telling us, 
congratulations, Aaron and Daniel, you have been chosen to be the parents of a baby girl that was born yesterday. So in an instant, we had finally become the parents that we had always dreamed of. Those were the hardest five and a half years of my life. And I feel that going through infertility really delayed the healing process of genetic testing for me because it kept bringing Huntington's disease up month after month after month when sometimes all I wanted to do was ignore it as a way of coping. And I put so much pressure on myself to make the right decision in terms of how to have a child. And what I have since learned is that there is no wrong way to create your family and that only you can decide what is right for you and your unique set of circumstances. And even within families, brothers and sisters, opinions will differ and that's okay. I was diagnosed quite a while ago. That was back in 2007. And I kept my diagnosis a secret for a very, very long time. And I eventually began to feel like I wasn't fully living my life and I was always holding a part of myself back. And I got sick of living that way. And that's why I decided to write a book about my experiences, which was just released last fall. And I've only started speaking about Huntington's disease publicly and connecting myself publicly to HD in the past three or four years. And I feel it's important to share our experiences and support each other and to help others outside of the HD community even understand what we are going through. So that's why I'm here today and that's why I feel it's so important to share our stories. Thank you. And I will say, as I was listening to you, Aaron, I had a chance to read your book previously, which I really enjoyed. And I was like, I remember that part. I remember that chapter that you were talking about. about <laughs> although I don't know if I remember the hot tub. And now I'm curious. Did you get a hot tub? No, we never got a hot tub. <laughs> uh, never too late. Never too late to get a hot tub. Um, but thank you both again for just sharing your, your personal story. And you're right. It's so important to share because you know one it's like you never know who's listening who's like wow I really needed to hear that right I mean I'm looking at the chat for both of you and it's like seeing people saying thanks like you could have made their day you could have made you know they might have said wow I'm not alone right and so it's great to to know that and and so I know we have some time for for questions um you know one of the questions you know I'm, I'm wondering is like what do you recommend to someone thinking about testing because you know there's of course one side of the coin is negative the other is positive so do you have any kind of recommendations or anything you might do differently if you were to do it again now knowing all the knowledge you've gained uh, well myself I went through um, testing without anybody in my family knowing <laughs> which was not really a good idea <laughs> but I, I was just so afraid of Huntington's disease and um, my dad said he wasn't going to get tested and then I could get tested after he got his results. And I really didn't want to pressure him into finding out just because my biological clock was ticking. So that's kind of why I did it without my family knowing, but I really wished I had reached out to my brothers and let them know. And during that waiting period, I, I rehearsed my results appointment over and over again in my head, like a million times. And looking back on it, I was just causing myself to suffer so much because I re I lived that results appointment a million times over before it actually happened. Um, so I guess I would suggest not doing that. Yeah. And how long did you have to wait, Aaron, give or take? Uh, so I had to wait four months to actually get into the clinic and speak to a genetic counselor. And then after I had my blood drawn, it was eight weeks until I got my results. Yeah. And, and what's interesting, I'm sure it varies. And you know, for me, it was two weeks in and out, which was like, yeah, I was I, going back and like, dang, that should have been a lot longer. But like, Tess, <laughs> what about what about you? Like, how long was the process for you? It Give was or take. about a year, year long uh, process. But yeah, I like I said, we I, I was very clear from the beginning that I wanted to do the test. And I haven't uh, ever regret taking it uh so yeah but yeah it depends on the pe person you know some people need to maybe uh, chat about it uh, with different kind of people and yeah 
Yeah, and then like any recommendations for someone going through testing? Like Aaron, you mentioned you wish your your family was involved. Is there anything else that either of you would say, hey, my, you know, personally, it would have helped if I did X, Y, and Z, or it may help someone else if they do a certain way? Not that one way is the only way, but any other exactly. helpful tips? I found, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that, I mean, it's a different process for everyone, but in my believing, uh, I think also it's it's good to know, you know, because uh, it can damage a lot also to, to take too much of a time uh, because like we heard from Sadie and Mackenzie and lots of other people testing negative, uh, maybe you spend too much time sometimes to, uh, but it's up to everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, that's my advice that don't be so afraid. And uh, did, I, I um, oh, go on, Eric. Sorry, no, I good. was just gonna say that something that I found very helpful was I did have like a handful of people, like two or three people, who knew what was happening, and we had a discussion before I went in for t- my test results, where they said to me, "What do you want me to do if you get bad news?" and I told them how I wanted them to act. You know, some people just want to kind of curl up in bed and not be bothered. But I knew for me, that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to continue living my life and getting out because I felt that would be best for me. So I told them that. So then they would just call me up and say, come on, we're going to go for a run or come on, we're going for coffee. So um, even when I didn't have the emotional energy to reach out to them, they were always reaching out to me, which was very helpful. Awesome. And, you know, with HD, right, and I can share myself being, you know, in this positive state, sometimes, at least for me, I used to always surround myself doing everything HD related, like getting involved, volunteering and everything. So I've learned it's important to separate it. What do you two do to try to separate your HD related work or advocacy efforts with just anything else that you do? I think I, I sometimes you need to just take a break uh, because, uh, and I've done that for, and even for a couple of years, I, I was kind of laid back about it because, and then I, I love gardening and I had dogs and I, I like to be out and yeah. It's awesome. There you go. That, uh, just something that you really enjoy doing, you know, if it's an, a trip and adventure or just being outside or whatever, sitting in the sofa, watching a movie. I, I find it really hard to do. <laughs> I find um, it's just kind of all consuming sometimes. And I really have to um, step back very intentionally and uh, because it can be very stressful. I've been doing a lot of podcasts speaking about HD and it's emotionally exhausting, even though this, it doesn't upset me to speak about my story and I'm not crying about it anymore. It's still, it's still hard to put yourself out there. So I have actually um, started meditating, which isn't something I had done before. And even if it's just 10 minutes a day, it really does make a huge big difference. And I've discovered because of COVID and you're being stuck in the city more, I've discovered some really beautiful parks and ravines in my neighborhood. So I tend to go for walks and just getting out in nature several times a week. And for me also playing sports is really amazing because it really puts you in the moment and you're not thinking about anything else while you're playing volleyball or rock climbing or things like that. Awesome. It looks like one of our attendees their dog was so happy that they started typing something on the (laughs) Uh, but no I think that's that's awesome and you know I just appreciate you both sharing your your different perspectives I think it's just important Um, so I just wanted to thank you both again for really just being brave and sharing your stories and also for your involvement um within the HD community. It's it's important mm-hmm. to continue to advocate, not just for yourselves, for others, right? That we meet along the, this journey. And so uh, yeah. definitely appreciate it. And just wanted to thank you both again for 
dropping on. Um, any other kind of final thoughts that you want to share? No, we just hope for a, a good, great uh, uh, evening here now at the event. So keep it coming. <laughs> I, I guess I would say that some people call the years between when you test positive and you have symptoms, the in-between years. And sometimes it can be difficult to live in, in those years and witness other people going through the thing that you're going to be going through one day. But I guess it's just really, I feel it's really good for people to know that you can live a fulfilling and happy life, even though your future includes HD, just sometimes you have to work it a little bit harder. Well said. And the, la the last, last thing someone asked, what is your book called, Erin? Oh, it's called All Good Things. There you go. And on that note. <laughs> Thank you. We, we, well, that's perfect. You were talking about, about thinking about the good things and you're like, Hey, <laughs> my book. Um, so now we have a quick 15 minute break before we get started with our next two sessions. Uh, you can find on track two, an update from wave life sciences, or you can stay here on track one where we're going to hear from two young people sharing about deciding not to test awesome well we can kind of get we can start the conversation now but uh welcome back everyone um to our i was gonna say it's our says our last segment but i'm gonna say maybe our last segment of this piece of it which is the personal perspective piece where we're gonna hear from Charlotte and Bruce to share their perspectives on starting to get tested but not finishing and just kind of hearing their uh, experiences, what it was like, and then we'll kind of open it up for a Q&A uh, at the end. So if you do have questions, don't hesitate to post them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, they can be anonymous or, you know, I will always have some questions in the back of my mind to also ask the both of you. So with that being said, Charlotte, we'll kick it off with you. Yeah, of course. I've just noticed that my mom and dad have said hi in the chat, so. <laughs> um, but hi everyone, um, I'm Charlotte and I'm 24 years old. Um, I'm from the Northeast of England and I'm so grateful to be here today sharing a little bit about my HD story and specifically um, my genetic testing journey. So I first found out about HD when I, when I was around 11 years old. Um, my nana and my mum both tested positive at a similar time after the passing of my great nana, um, who we didn't find out had the disease until after she died, unfortunately. My family have never hid the reality of the disease from us and our risk of inheriting it. I quickly had to grow up as my nana's symptoms became worse. Um, she was a widow and my mum an only child. We are a very small family and luckily very close. My nana moved into an assisted living apartment and I would visit her every day after school. I learned to cook and clean at a young age to help with her care. I never told any of my friends at the time. Caring is hard, as I'm sure a lot of you will know, but as I loved my role as her carer. We were the best of friends. She went into a nursing home in 2014 and I visited every day still, doing a lot of her personal care because she often refused anybody's help apart from mine. I moved to the university. Um, I almost didn't go because I wanted to look after her, but she wanted to pursue me to pursue my career. As a compromise, I moved just 40 minutes away and I'd often drive home every week because she refused to allow carers to shower her or take her medication unless I was there. I knew her like the back of my hand. I was relied on her by her as a safety net and I'd often get calls from the nurse at home in the middle of the day, sometimes late at night, to say she'd been crying and anxious for hours. They knew I was the only person who would be able to calm her down. My mum had left work years before as her symptoms started to become problematic. I was juggling my time between them both, but I never minded, obviously, the two most important women in my life. All of us have been impacted by COVID and the pandemic made visiting my nana impossible. The nursing home shut its doors to all visitors, no matter how poorly your loved ones were. I physically couldn't live knowing she was in there without me. So in July, 2020, at the height of the pandemic, 
I applied for a carer's job at a nursing home and I was successful at interview. I worked nine to five during the week at my full-time office job for the National Health Service and I worked 12 hour shifts both Saturday and Sunday. I looked after 40 other residents, but I was able to spend some time with my nana after shifts, something I'll never forget. I honestly loved this role with all my being, but unfortunately my nana lost her long hard battle with HD just two months ago in December, 2021. My mum's symptoms have progressed considerably, but looking after my nana has prepared me to be the best carer I can be for her. A lot of her symptoms were initially behavioural, but the physical symptoms are really starting to show. She's incredible though, and I can't put into words how inspirational she is. Now, the part you've all come to listen to, <coughs> genetic testing. I've always been very aware and hypervigilant, which I've told, which I've been told comes from caring with someone for someone with such complex needs and always ready to expect the unexpected. In England, you can begin the testing process at 18 years old. So as soon as I turned 18, I went to my doctor and asked for a referral to the genetic clinic. At the time, I was almost certain I wanted to find out if I had carried the gene or not. I remember my first genetic counselor meeting like it was yesterday. I met with Sharon, the genetic counsellor in Newcastle, who coincidentally had diagnosed my mum and nan all those years, all those years before. I know Sharon will be watching this session at some point, so hi Sharon. Considering all the thoughts I was having, scared about my future, Sharon instantly put me at ease. During the appointment, we went through the facts, my family history, the science behind HD, how it's genetically passed on, and uh, this stuff I was clueless about at the time. I really valued this. It was the black and white of why my life was the way it was. We discussed my reasons for wanting to find out, which included just being very curious and thinking this might help with my worry. Sharon explained the pros and cons pros and cons of testing. Something I'll always remember was her asking, what would you gain from finding out right now? And I sat and I couldn't really answer it. At the time, there was no real reason for me to find out apart from the worries that I had, but I think I would have had them anyway with a negative or positive test with my loved one still being unwell. Me and Sharon continued to meet every year, sometimes more often, and I went back and forth with the, with the decision, but I was never certain. She always said, I will know when the time is right. I'm the most indecisive person known to man anyway, so the meetings with Sharon really eased my anxieties. I also came to the conclusion, as sad as it was, that I knew I was going to lose my nan soon. I didn't want my own journey to taint how I managed to cope with the pressure of her being so unwell and reliant on me. Sharon was so supportive and initially I felt bad that I was going to see her all these times and just couldn't make a decision. But she reassured me that people visited the service for sometimes decades before saying yes to the test. Another reason I decided to stop the process was guilt. My family have never put any pressure on me to find out if I have the gene, quite the opposite. But my mum is a very kind, caring lady and she worries just like I do. I knew if I decided to test and if it was, po and it was positive, um, she would feel guilty and I never wanted to impact her mental health further. My sister is 21 and she's of the mind that ignorance is bliss. She says, why would I want to find out about something that's gonna make me sad? A mindset I envy and I'm very proud of, but very proud of her for. I think she started to think about it a little more since we lost my nan. So I booked an appointment with Sharon for both of us to go together for her first appointment in the next few months. I always worry that my decision to test will put pressure on her to want to find out. And like others have said in this panel, I'd much rather me test positive than her. I went back to see Sharon early last year, just before losing my nana, this time with my long-term partner. We've been together for four years and we bought a house together last year. I've always known I wanted children, so we discussed together maybe finding out so we could start planning what kind of things we might need to consider. Sharon taught my partner through everything just as she did with me in, in that first meeting. And we found that so helpful as a couple but afterwards decided again, we weren't ready to have children just yet. And my nan was on a palliative care plan. So I was worried finding out would tip me over the edge. I was coping up with everything at that moment in time. Was it really necessary now? Jenna was telling me in a conversation that I had with her the other week that the prov provision of genetic counseling isn't the case across the world. And I'm sorry to those of you that may not have this option. I think that's why this community is so val valuable because a lot of us have been through the process and can share our experiences and more importantly, just listen to people's concerns and worries. 
don't get me wrong, this, there isn't a day that goes past that I don't wonder if I have HD or not. I symptom search all the time, convince myself that I'm seeing the disease, but at the end of the day, life is so precious and I've started to learn to live for today. Not plan too far in the future unless I really need to. I started sharing my story on social media, raising funds and generally being more active in the community, a community I didn't even know existed about a year ago. I'm now more open with my friends and they're very supportive of my life and my circumstances. I can't control the disease, but I can control how people perceive it and understand it. My family seem to have a later onset of the disease too, and I feel very lucky to have built this relationship with my nana, as I know not everybody gets this opportunity. So that's, that's my story. So hand over to, to Bruce. All right, Bruce, it's all, it's all you now. Hello. Um... Make sure that's working. Um, hi, I'm Bruce. Uh, I'm from Scotland um, and I'm currently a, a master's student in software engineering uh, and I also work as a research assistant in human robotic interaction. Um, I'm also a part of the HD community advisory board um, and I'm a youth ambassador for HD Bio and for Scottish Huntington's Association. Um, but hopefully uh, here today I'm to give a to give a quick story on my experience of deciding not to test um, and hopefully share my thoughts and a bit of reasoning about how I kind of came to this conclusion. Um, so my involvement with HD started back in 2014, um, when I was just 14, um, and I was just beginning my first set of exams in high school. Um, and then it was on the day of the Grand National in April, um, and it was just after, after the race had run, um, my parents kind of sat there and they paused the TV and I, I looked over um, and they sat me down and they went, well, um, your dad's been diagnosed with Huntington's. Um, that was quite a shock, as you can imagine. Um, feelings of worry, fear, and a lot of confusion filled my mind. Um, I mean, I, I had noticed in the past that there was something not quite right, um, I think as a lot of people do. And however, most of the symptoms that he was facing at that time uh, were fairly mental symptoms. Um, so I thought the kind of anxiety and depression and things um, were just due to financial issues we were having with the business at the time. Um, however, it clearly wasn't. Um, and my parents tried to tell me some of the information about HD and what it meant for me and my dad, um, but I needed more information. Um, and I wanted to know kind of everything that I could do about the disease that was going to impact my life in so many ways. Um, so I ran up the stairs in just a few tears um, and began looking up information. Um, and back then, resources hadn't really fully developed, um, and many of them were not as easily findable as they are now. Um, so I struggled to find much insight. Um, so eventually, after doing some Googling and things, I went back down the stair, um, pretty much even more worried than I was before, um, and tried to ask my parents a few questions. Uh, however, they had also suffered the same um, lack of information at the time. Um, but the next again day, I decided um, I'm going to contact Scottish Huntington's Association. Um, however, coincidentally, I contacted, um, there's several youth workers for Scotland, um, and I contacted the youth worker who was both on holiday and covered the north of Scotland, which is nowhere near where I live. Um, so it took a little bit of time because of my accidental miss email. Um, however, I eventually came in contact with Kirsten, um, who brought me all the contact, uh, all the resources that I could need and answer kind of all my questions at the time. Uh, but the one sort of lingering question in my head was, how would this impact me? Um, I'm I'm quite a direct person, um, and unfortunately, from the questions I'd asked so far, um, I kind of had already figured out the fate of my dad. Um, and as difficult as that was to take, um, it was kind of an unknown what would happen to me still. Um, they explained the 50-50 risk um, and how it worked all genetically, but even after all that, the question still remained. Um, was I positive or negative? Um, and I guess that answer would affect how I live my life, right? Um, so continuing for a few years, um, I became a lot more heavily involved with the Scottish Huntington's Association, um, especially the youth service. Um, I attended summer camps, and the group activities, and started building up my confidence um, through them. Um, and learned more about the disease and how it impacted other like, young people like me. Um, but even all through this, the question still kind of remained, how would my brain react um, if I got a result? Um, if I tested. Um, so would a positive result just make me break down and be unable to do anything? Um, would a negative just give me permanent survivor's guilt? Um, 
there's not really any way of predicting how you would react or how I would react. Um, and I guess either way, there's a strong negative that might happen. Um, so my mind just went, either way, if you get a result, it'll impact you negatively. Don't get tested. Um, and um, I mean, at this time, I was still sort of 15, 16, 17. Um, so I was unable to get tested either way. Um, and in Scotland, you need uh, three counselling sessions before you're able to go through testing, and you must be over 18. Um, so I went through all my teens, kind of completely with my mind made up. Don't get tested. You can't anyway. Um, and then I turned 18, and my mind immediately went, but you could. And that kind of just built up a lot more and more and more. Um, I never realised how much being unable to get tested was keeping the lid sort of on my on the um, on the question. I wanted to plan out my life. I wanted to organize. I wanted to know if in 20, 30 years I was going to be impacted by this disease. Um, so I tossed and turned for quite a few years. Um, and many moments of high stress where I was like, I need to know. Um, and many more moments where I was like, knowing would make me feel even worse. Um, and I participating in Enroll HD um, in the meantime where I could. Um, However, everything kind of peaked in 2020, uh, just after the very first heavy lockdown. Uh, and my stress had just built up and um, with some extended family issues. I had jury duty. I was trying to write my dissertation for my bachelor's. I had plenty of other courses going on. My car decided to broke down. Then I just kind of snapped. Um, my brain just completely broke down. I mean, I, I can't organize my time if I don't have any. Um, and the thing that came straight to the forefront of my mind uh, when everything else was kind of tumbling around me was Huntington's. Um, I pretty much convinced myself immediately that I had it. Uh, I convinced myself that the stress was just a secondary thing. And the reason I was struggling um, and everything was because of HD symptoms. Uh, my hands were shaking a little bit. I was forgetting things. I was unable to keep a level head. And I was unable to keep a quiet head. Um, I think everyone with the possibility of HD symptom watches um, and secretly everyone's fairly convinced that those tiny trembles in their hand must be early symptoms. Um, but I guess this made me think for the first time properly, I must know. Um, and I guess another feeling during these times is always loneliness. Um, it's so difficult to escape your head and find that there, there are there are others in the same situation when there's no windows in your head and every wall is just covered with writing, screaming at you and casing you further into your own skull. Um, but I eventually broke down in front of somebody very close to me, my mum, and that convinced me, well, I need to do it for her. Not get tested, but get help. <laughs> um, so I reached out first to the SHJ, um, who referred me for two genetic services. Um, and I was put in touch with a clinical psychologist in Edinburgh. Um, I unfortunately, due to a mix-up, it took me a bit longer than it should have um, to get in touch with a psychologist. Um, but when I did, um, a lot of the heavy, he heavy hitting stress was over, um, and I was slowly but surely returning to only somewhat heavily stressed. Um, but I got, began speaking with them, um, and they initially kind of taught me some tricks with cognitive behavioral therapy and other techniques to kind of sort of handle and manage stress and things. Um, However, we fairly quick to quickly moved on to testing. Um, this psychologist I had was great um, and was talking me through the process, what steps were involved, um, how I would find out the result. Um, and at this point, I was sort of like, you know, I'm convinced I have it. Um, everything's going on around me. Um, I need to know. And she asked me, well, why do you want to get tested? You know, the kind of the question. And I should note, in no way was she pressuring me either side of the fence. Um, but I sat there and I kind of stammered a bit, paused, and I went, I, I don't really know. Um, I knew the whole process. I knew the possible results. I knew everything that I did know. Um, and I didn't have an answer. I kind of returned to the state I was before where I was like, I don't really think I want to. Um, and it's true in that moment and probably building up for ages beforehand. There was no light bulb in my head. There was no magic question. There was a puzzle where the final piece went in. I don't really want to know. Because I don't think it would make a difference. Um, and I might be wrong about that. I, I guess I'll never really know the answer. Um, but either way, no matter the result, I still want to live my life sort of in the same way. And if, if I explore the two scenarios, if I get tested, what then? I test positive. The best possible result, I break down for a while again. That sucks. Um, I call my way back up uh, and I live my life sort of second by second. I make sure I grasp every opportunity I can and make a difference, have a fun experience. And that doesn't suck. Um, Moving on, if I test negative, 
the best possible result that happens. I don't break down. I magically don't get survivor's guilt. What I do then? Well, I appreciate my life. Um, I live my life to the fullest. I um, live it second by second. I make sure I grasp every opportunity. It's it's the same. Um, the result is the same in the end. Um, I'm one of one of them. Just sucks a lot more. Um, because I might not get to do. I might not get to do it for as long. Um, whether this decision stays the same forever, who knows? It's not really a done deal. Um, however, I'm fairly comfortable now in my headspace of not knowing. Um, I've thought about things that might sway it. I guess I'm quite lucky, as to be perfectly honest. I'm not really that interested in having children at this point in my life or sort of soon. Um, I 100% agree that decision and the impact that it has would probably sway me um, much, much closer to get tested, um, or at least considering something like BGD. Um, I'm also extremely lucky to have a very supportive girlfriend who is um, mostly the same as both as me and doesn't want to have children naturally. Um, so adoption and things similar are, are on the table for us. Um, another thing I've considered is an effective treatment. Um, I think in that case, well, uh, I know either way, um, the best possible outcome, I want to have a happy life. Um, if I can extend that and make it longer, why wouldn't I? Um, I guess I'm still on the fence about clinical trials as well. Um, I try to look at each of them when they come out. Um, but if I have to be tested partic to participate, I guess I feel I wouldn't be confident enough to cope with the result well enough. Um, and that kind of leads me to where I am now, um, where I'm participating in as much as I can while sort of living in ignorance, I guess. Um, but in a in a happy ignorance, knowing that I'm comfortable and knowing that um, I'm happy where I am. And I'm very thankful. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate both of you sharing um, just your, your stories and kind of where you're at. And I think what's important, right? And it goes back to the other earlier panels is that it's a personal decision. It's case by case. It doesn't mean that if someone else tests that you have to test, right? It's a case by case. And it sounds like both of you were able to find the support you needed and continue to go on your own journey. And, you know, it's interesting because I think about of, of all the people that are at risk, I think it's like 10 or so actually go through genetic testing and you know one of the cases you mentioned it bruce was like you know they, well i'm not going to say what you said exactly but what i got out of it is like there's no treatment right now so and i'm not necessarily impacted right now so what's the point point? and i think that's okay for, for you to say that right because you're like that's that's what it is um but you know curious from and we have about eight minutes but and we do have one question but before we get to that for the both of you, just understanding kind of the where you're at now, what would you tell someone that is looking to go through genetic testing? Um, uh, do you mind if I go first, Bruce? I don't know. Yeah, um, I would say, I mean, from my like genetic counseling experience, I mean, I know not, I don't know if everyone's just the same and. But from my experience, I would just say to kind of inquire and kind of go to the appointment or just ask, you know, for that support from the genetic counsellors, because I've had, you know, I, I count, I don't know how many genetic counselling appointments I've had now, um, but there's never any pressure to find out. So like just because you're having an, an appointment and you're discussing it, I found that actually going to that initial appointment really eased a lot of my anxieties um, and just talking to somebody who had complete knowledge of the whole process and knew exactly what I was going through I found very comforting um so I suppose if you're comfortable with it just kind of talk to a professional or even just kind of just talk to somebody else because I used to I went through secondary school and never I, I don't think I told anybody that I was experiencing HD you know I used to come to school after caring for my nan and my mum and like I'd go through things and nobody would ever know um but I found like talking to friends and family like Bruce said you know opening up to people um it's actually it's so valuable and you know there is people there who want to support you so I think just talking and kind of seeking that professional advice if you know you're comfortable to do it um is a good start I suppose and, and maybe for Bruce there's someone that mentioned if you were to meet a 14 year old in the same situation as you were at, at the same age what piece of advice would you give give to them I guess sort of pretty much what Charlotte said, kind of, you have to be, reach out, speak to someone, 
and sort of get the information that you you want um it will at the end of the day always be your your, your own decision um but try and i guess being as clued up as possible being as um knowing what's going on around you and um what's going on in sort of the world and research and um other support bubbles is so important to sort of feeling supported um and yeah i i would just make it extremely clear the information is out there and you're not alone and yeah what what resources helped you or still help you today that you would recommend to someone um charlotte if you've got it i'm trying to remember the name. <laughs> <laughs> i can see matt's message just come up um to be fair like hcyo obviously there's i feel like there's a wealth of kind of resources available even becoming like me and Bruce have become ambassadors like even you know opportunities like that and even just sharing my story on social media like I've spoken to people have messaged me like Ashley who spoke yesterday at the social media panel um she was the first person I ever spoke to in the HD community and when I was doing a fundraiser last year she messaged me and she said can I share your story on my blog and I was like oh my goodness yes and I had so many people like follow me on Instagram like or I've just read your story in Ashley's blog, like I really li- like relate to you, et cetera. So I suppose resources in that like social media and like kind of reaching out to people in a similar situation, but also kind of charities like HDIO. I'm quite, um, I get involved with the HTA here in the UK as well and do a lot of fundraising for them. And I've built quite a good relationship with them. So I feel like your worry and everything that goes on with HD as much as it's really difficult and, sometimes it's so hard to cope I feel like having that kind of almost like a distraction of like the positive impact that you have is a really good um help for like all those kind of worries and thoughts that you have so yeah resources and only kind of learn and it's also I suppose it helps your mental health as well now this next question might be I'm going to throw it out there, but, you know, just as Bruce mentioned it earlier, there's no treatments right now, but if you, would, do you think your mind would be different if, again, I don't want to name it a day and time, but if there's a treatment, right, if there's an option out there, do you think that would change your mind on, on testing? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, I think it would change mine. I don't, I don't know if it would sort of convince me, but it would definitely make me consider it like a lot um it would it's sort of like what i was saying either either way you want to live your life in the same way where you're happy you're content you've made a difference um that would just enable it further if there was an effective treatment yeah i agree and one one thing i would say is you know kind of going back to the testing so i tested when i was 20 but like prior to that, you know, going through that of like the symptom hunting you mentioned earlier, Bruce, and like, does that still, do you, do you guys either, does that still play a role, you know, thinking like, oh, this could be a symptom, this may not. And like, how do you kind of sometimes push through that? Do you want me to go first, Bruce, if you don't mind? Go for it, yeah. <laughs> I suppose, I mean, I'm definitely guilty of that. Like, uh, as I, I think I said in my when I spoke that I'm naturally quite an anxious person anyway so I think initially like you're always wondering like oh my goodness is this HD and like you convince yourself that you have it um but I think the as kind of loot it sounds a bit like not sad but I don't want to kind of put down on things but I think losing my nan um after looking after her for so many years really put things into perspective for me um because you know there's only so much we can control life and I think if the when we're worrying about things we don't even know are like a thing um you know we, we would get to the point where if we were positive I often used to look at my nanny used to think like do you regret things and you don't want to I suppose you don't want to regret the symptom searching because it's time wasted and it's time lost that you could have been- oh. oh I think Maybe her laptop wasn't plugged in all the way, or her yeah. iPad. <laughs> well, first, do you want to you want to take the film on that one? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, I I would have pretty much said the exact same thing. It is very much you. 
the time you're spending symptom hunting, you're not living life, I guess. Um, as much as it is extremely difficult, and I think every pot, I, I can confidently say that every person I've spoke to who I've spoke to about symptom hunting has admitted they've done it at some point. Um, I think it's just innate with the worry of HD is that you just notice things and you kind of then immediately begin worrying. And if you're sort of in a, I think my, the psychologist I spoke to described it as sort of like a faulty car alarm, um, which is when it's already sort of down, when it's already stressed and it's already broken in some way, um, I, even the slightest gust of wind will just set it off. So if I'm extremely stressed, if I've got loads going on, um, it's even a tiny little bit of symptom hunting where I look at my hands a bit too hard one day and I just notice them shaking in some way. Um, then it really affects you significantly. Um, but... did, your, did your iPad die? Yeah, it was plugged into my <laughs> laptop and I thought the laptop was charging it, but obviously not. And to be fair, I'm actually so glad it happened. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's all right. You came back right in time as we're closing up. So, uh, <laughs> you know, just... For, for anyone out there that's interested in, you know, learning more just on testing, you know, feel free to check out HDO's booth, check out their website. I think there's a lot of great information out there. Um, and just thank you too for taking some time to share your, your personal experiences on, you know, the starting the testing process, but not completing and, you know, why it's okay to kind of go at your own, go at this at your own pace. So thank you both again. And with that being said, we now have uh, on track, what is it? Track one, I don't know. They're, the next two tracks, I don't know which track is which, but we have two tracks next, which is Professor Sarah Tabrizi talking about the research staging system study. I think that's on track one or track two. We have Astri from the European Huntington Association talking about this new community ad board called HD tab, which stands for community advisory board. So definitely check those out. And then after that, we have one last session to wrap us up. So thank you again. And I hope everyone has a good next session. Thank you. Thanks guys. Bye.